Chapter 3. God Meet Memon. One thing unites all these different groups of Kansans, these millionaires and trailer park dwellers, these farmers and thrift store managers and slaughterhouse workers and utility executives. They're almost all Republicans. Meatpacking Garden City voted for George W. Bush in even greater numbers than did affluent Johnson County. The blue-collar, heavily unionized city of Wichita used to be one of the few Democratic strongholds in the state. In the 90s, it became one of the most consistently conservative places of them all, a mighty fortress in the wars over abortion, evolution, loose interpretation of the Constitution, and water fluoridation. Not, long, not too long ago, Kansas would have responded to the current situation by making bastards pay. This would have been a political certainty, as predictable as what happens when you touch a match to a puddle of gasoline. When business screwed the farmers and the workers, when it implemented monopoly strategies invasive beyond the populace's furthest imaginings, when it ripped off shareholders and casually tossed thousands out of work, you could be damn sure about what would follow. Not these days. Out here, the gravity of discontent pulls only in one direction, to the right, to the right, farther to the right. Strip today's Kansans of their job security and they head out to become registered Republicans. Push them off their land, and less than you know, they're protesting in front of abortion clinics. Squander li their life savings on manicures for the CEO, and there's a good chance they'll join the John Birch Society. But ask them about remedies for their ancestors proposed unions, antitrust, public ownership, and you might as well be referring to the days when kinghood was in flower. The ills described here, depopulation, the rise in, of the food trust, the general reorganization of life to favor the wealthy have been going on for 10 to 20 years now. Nobody denies that they have happened, that they're still happening, yet Kansas, that famous warrior for justice, how does it react? Why Kansas looks at its problems straight in the eye, sets its jaw, rolls up its sleeves, and charges off in exactly the wrong direction. It's not that Kansas isn't angry. Rage is a bumper crop here. And Kansas has produced enough fury to give every man, woman, and child in the country apoplexy. The state is in rebellion. The state is up in arms. It's just that the arms are all pointing away from the culprit. Kansans don't just care about economic issues, gloats Republican Senator Sam Brownback, a man who believes that the cause of poverty is spiritual rather than mechanistic. Kansans have set their rights sights on grander things, like the purity of the nation, good wages, fair play in farm country, the fate of the small town, even the one we live in. All these are distant second to the evolution, which we strike w from the books and public education, which we will undermine in a hundred inventive ways. Here, as our leaders square off against the issues today, what afflicts us is the crisis of the soul, wails Wichita Congressman Todd Tyart. What motivates us, says the leader of the state's largest anti-abortion group, is discussed with the immoral decadence in society. We in America, and we here in Kansas, are in a moral crisis, thunders the state's conservative Galadad David Miller to his armies of followers. What we need is to become virtuous, as per the Founding Fathers' clear instructions, for if we fail, our entire culture may be lost. In the heights of Capitol Hill, the great Brownback denounces gangster rap, inveighs against stem cell research, and proposes that the U.S. Senate hold hearings to investigate America's cultural decline. The state's strategy for waging this war for America's soul has been blunt and direct. Kansas has tolled its churches for the most aggressively po poised individuals it could find and has proceeded to elevate them to the most prominent positions of public responsibility available, whence these saintly missionaries are then expected to embark and howl and rebuke the world for its sins. I am a Christian, the leader of Wyandotte 
County GOP once told a reporter by way of explaining his political plans, primarily my goal is to build the kingdom of God. And thus we have a U.S. representative from central Kansas, the legendary track star Jim Ryun, who says he ran for office because God wanted him to, and is glad to tell reporters the exact date in 1972 when he became a Christian. Run once thrilled his followers at a campaign event by speaking in tongues, and in 1995, he published an article describing the hyperprotective social order he imposes upon his female children. If a young man is interested in a young woman, he starts by praying about the relationship. With the go-ahead from the Lord and his parents, he then approaches the girl's parents. The parents pray, and if the young woman has reciprocal interest in the young man, her father talks through courtship and his expectations with the fellow. The young man has by now received two separate green lights from the Almighty, but is still not enough for courtship to commence. Next, he must demonstrate to Jim's satisfaction that he is spiritually and financially prepared to marry. Eventually, Run has to see the money up front. From Wichita comes Tom to Hart, a man notable mainly for his perfectly swooping hair who campaigns in the city's evangelical churches and peppers his conversation with biblical references. What it's all about, the triumphant tryhard told the, Wich- the Wichita Eagle on the occasion of his upset victory over the district's long-standing Democratic representative is bringing America back to God, or, more accurately, scolding America for its insufficient godliness. On three separate occasions in 1998, Trihart admonished the nation from the floor of Congress for losing its soul and turning its back on God and family values. Where Trihart is fury, Sam Brownback is thoughtful and soft-spoken, the intellectual of Kansas conservatives. If speaking in tongues is runes trademark brownback's signature gesture was the time he washed his washed the feet in the manner of jesus christ of an assistant who was leaving his service while the kansas conservative style generally features loud sweaty campaigning at the most energetic and anti-heretical sort of protestant churches charismatic pentecostal assemblies of god brownback favors the approach of the unhurried insider the ultramontane even in 2002 he converted to catholicism under the supervision of reverend john makowski and leading light of opus day the ultra conservative prelature renowned for its role in the franco regime in spain nor is opus day the only right-wing quasi cult which brownback has chose to link himself when in washington he lives in a townhouse operated by a christian group known as the family or the fellowship whose mission seems to be bringing together American lawmakers with capitalists and dictators from around the world and studying the leadership secrets of Hitler. However bizarre some such eruptions of zealotry might be, they are not enough by themselves to discredit this, these men. What makes the Kansas way so remarkable and so dysfunctional is that in each case, the state's lawmakers combine this flamboyant public piety with political agenda that only makes the state's material problems worse. Protestant fundamentalism, remember, is not necessarily friendly to big business. After all, once gave the world to William Jennings Bryan, who was widely regarded as being only a few steps shy of an anarchist. But even though Kansas is burning on the free market prairie, each of the state leaders described here is dedicated an apostle to the free market doctrine as they are to the teachings of Jesus. Each one, for example, receives high ranking from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for his pro-business voting records, and each one has pledged himself to the sacred conservative causes of deregulating, dismantling government and rolling back the welfare state. Jim Run, for example, may have built a wall around his daughters to protect them from our lavacious culture, 
but there is virtually no aspect of corporate orthodoxy that he has not internalized and endorsed. He has compared American economic policy of pre-Reagan years to Soviet Union and supported tax cuts for the rich on grounds that the wealthy need incentives to keep on making their superhuman con contributions to society. He supported the repeal of estate tax on the delusional pretext that removing it would help family farms. He expressed doubt in the global warming and he blamed the California electricity crisis not on deregulation but on the state's political establishment, which interfered with the free market. You can go right down the list, checking off items one after another. Ruins earnest Christianity causes not a single deviation from the big business agenda that I have been able to detect. Todd Tyhart was the manager of Boeing before going to Congress, and he may be even more ferociously committed to than run to the nation's corporate brass. In Washington, he is known mainly for his single-minded host to the Department of Energy. According to Wichita's remaining Democrats, it is his hostility to organized labor that distinguishes him. In 1992, the Wichita Eagle dryly summarized his views on non-religious matters. Tyhart dislikes government in general. Despite Boeing's massive reliance on government defense spending, he calls for the privatization of prisons says that some people are poor because they are determined to be poor and describe social welfare programs as inefficient. Four years later, the paper noted that this moral crusader had become the toast of corporate Wichita. When Koch Industries, a Wichita oil and gas concern that funds right-wing magazines and think tanks in addition to politicians, held a fundraiser for TriHeart, the newspaper seemed surprised at how far this young man with the common touch had come. He's one of the new style of Republican conservatives, the paper pointed out. His social views are what most people talk about, but his thinking on economics is what company officials are more interested in. Tyhart is stridently pro-business, deeply suspicious of government, and convinced Big Brother is lurking behind volumes and volumes of government regulations. Of the bunch, though, is Sam, Sam Brownback, a member of one of the wealthiest families in the state who has done the most distinguished servants to God and Mammon both. Admirers of St. Sam will tell you about his much publicized fragility of his DC lifestyle and refer you to his high profile wars against human cloning and in support of persecuted Christians in third world countries. They would also do well to examine the peculiar series of events that propelled Brownback to public life back in 1993. At the time, Brownback was laboring in obscurity as Kansas Secretary of Agriculture, a position of little note but considerable power that he held since 1986. Which is not to say that Brownback was elected ag secretly or even appointed ag secretary or even appointed ag secretary by someone who was elected at the time the state's department of agriculture was a curious 19th century throwback that did not answer to the people at all brownback had been chosen for the post by the state's largest largest agricultural interest by the heads of every industry he was charged by overseeing for example when he made limits on dangerous herbicides voluntary, Brownback was acting as a government regulator, but a kind of regulator conservatives approve of, the kind who answers to private industry instead of the public. Unfortunately, the cozy world of Kansas agriculture was turned on its head by the lawsuit pointing out the unconstitutionality of the whole arrangement, and Brownback was forced to make his way in the world by other means. As a leader of of the freshman class of Republican congressmen elected in 1994, Brownback played a role of the principled outsider, working out of a tiny office where he had sprawled a, the amount of national debt on the whiteboard and endlessly, tirelessly denouncing the role of big PAC money in politics. He even wrote a poise meditation distinguishing 
ambition of the spiritual variety from the sinful, worldly ambition that often tempted members of Congress. Before long, though, Brownback found that the two varieties of ambition could complement each other nicely. In his 1996 campaign for the U.S. Senate, he was materially assisted by a shadowy corporate front group called the Triad Management Services, which poured sufficient last-minute money into the race to drown out the messages of his foe. Brownback celebrated the resulting victory at the, a reception sponsored by the U.S. Telecom Association, a powerful lobbying group for an industry whose derog deregulatory agenda the senator would advance diligently in years to come. Along the way, he learned to appreciate the virtue of big PAC money in politics, even finding a reason to vote against McCain-Feingold campaign finance reform measure. So it is with Sam Brownback right down the line, a man of sterling public principle he seems to take the side of corporate interest almost regardless of the issues at hand. This is true even when the corporate interests in question are industries whose products Brownback considers a source of evil. Such, at least, was the case in 2003, when one of Brownback's Senate committees was called upon to consider the growing problem of monopoly ownership in radio since the industry's deregulation seven years previously. Brownback, of course, has made a career out of denouncing the culture industry for its vulgarity, its bad values, presumably for the damage it has done to America's soul. Taking this opportunity to rein it in should have been a no-brainer. After all, as the industry critic Robert Machensi points out, the link between media ownership, the drive for profit, and the media's insulting content should be obvious to anyone with ears to hear. Vulgarity is linked to corporate control and highly concentrated, only semi-competitive markets, Machensi says. For many conservatives, the radio fight is a moment of truth. If people are seriously concerned about vulgarity, this is their chance to prove it. For that reason, Machensi votes, certain right-wing culture warriors are happy to join the fight against further relaxation of radio ownership rules, but Brownback was not one of them. Faced with a choice between protecting corporate profits and actually doing something about the open cultural sewer he has spent his career deploring, Brownback chose the former. Deregulation is always for the better, he insisted, and he even proceeded to scold the witnesses criticizing the industry for acting out, get this, self-interest. The free market system is inviolable In other words, even when it's that branch of system that you spend all your time campaigning against and for coercing, coercing our lives and leading us away from God. In Kansas, Maman always comes first. Mixing culture war and capitalism is not just a personal quirk shared by these three individuals. It is written in every manifesto of the Kansas conservative movement, the platform of the state's Republican Party for 1998 moaning that the signs of degenerating society are all around us, railing against abortion and homosexuality and gun control and evolution, a theory, not a fact. The document went on to propound a list of demands as friendly as politocracy as anything ever dreamed of by Monsanto or Microsoft. The platform called for a flat tax or national sales tax to replace graduated income tax in which the rich pay more than the poor. The abolition of taxes on capital gains, that is, on money you make when you sell stock, the abolition of estate tax, no governmental intervention in health care, the eventful privatization of Social Security, privatization in general, deregulization in general, and the operation of the free market system without government interference, the turning over of all federal lands to the states, and the prohibition of the use of taxpayer dollars to fund any election campaign. Along the way, the document specifically endorsed the disastrous Freedom to Farm Act, condemned agricultural price supports, and came out in favor 
of making soil conservation programs voluntary, perhaps out of nostalgia for the Dust Bowl days when Kansans learned a healthy fear of the Almighty. Let us pause for a moment to ponder all this American dysfunction. A state is spectacularly ill, served by the Reagan-Bush stampede of deregulation, privatization, and laissez-faire. It sees its countryside depopulated, its towns deintegrate, its cities stagnate, and its wealthy enclaves sparkle behind their remote-controlled security gates. The state erupts in a vault, revolt, making headlines around the world with its bold defense of, the, of convention. But what do rebels demand? More of the very measures that brought ruination on them and their neighbors in the first place. This is not just the mystery of Kansas, this is the mystery of America, the historical shift that has made it all possible. In Kansas, the shift is more staggering than elsewhere, simply because it has been so decisive, so extreme. The people who were once radical, now revolutionary. Though they speak today in the same aggrieved language of victimization, and though they face the same array of economic forces that has their hard-bitten ancestors, Today's populists make demands that are precisely the opposite. Tear down the federal farm programs, they cry, privatize the utilities, repeal the progressive taxes. All that Kansas asks today is a little help nailing itself to that cross of gold.